Paranormal Roundtable, PRT is what we call it. I'm your host, Josh Turner, also known as Wolf, and you can call me Mr. Wolf. Uh, I'm just kidding. Call me whatever you want, folks. It's your life. We're just living in it. And we are here on a Tuesday evening. We hope you're enjoying your day, your Tuesday evening, but we're going to take you on a journey for an hour or so to faraway lands, places where I don't want to go because they're terrifying. And I don't like to be in the ocean with uh, crazy, creepy, scary stuff. And that's what we're going to talk about. But first, let's get to uh, a couple things here. Paranormal Roundtable has a show we do every Friday. It's a Friday night live stream, and it comes out on YouTube exclusively. So if you're listening to us on Spotify or one of the many other platforms we're on, we're on uh, like a dozen of them, over over a, do- over a dozen. I don't know how many. we've. I've lost count, but we're on a bunch. And so if you are listening to us on one of those platforms and you say, you know, I like the content. I like to listen to the hour-long episodes. I'd like to look at this guy's face and see what he looks like and see how handsome I am. You can go and check me out. In the studio with with my ugly co-host uh, Tony uh, Mushu Noodles Udon oh whatever God. you want to call me. I even get the point love. is why do you like to interrupt all the time, dude? Is that you can come join us? Okay, anyway, or our community and this babbling guy he's on there, and then Anthony he's here tonight in the studio, and tonight we got Zane who sits in every now and then. That's my brother's son, and so he is going to join us tonight, and we are talking about C. Humanoidal sea creatures. That's what we're talking about today. I call them sea creatures. It sounds like you're talking about reptilian, like, you know, mosasaurs and plesiosaurs. No, we're not. That, that's that's a different subject. What we're talking about is humanoidal creatures. And uh, I'm going to get into some some myth, some myths and folklore and tell some stories of first-hand uh, accounts of what people claim that they saw. Uh, I'm not saying these are absolutely true. They're just what was told to us. And so I can't say, hey, this person is absolutely telling the truth, but... Um, you be the judge. Um, you you make up your own mind. I want to put that out there. I said that on the show on Friday because a uh, listener had said, well, I want to hear absolutely true stories. I said there is nowhere on the um, in a book or in a podcast that you can find that because you don't know. There's no way to know. So all you got to do is take their word for it if they said they saw it. But here's what I do. I pull stories that have threads. So if I get a story and it's got, you know, I find another one that's similar to that after I take it out of my one-off, I'm like, okay, here we go. Now you have something to build on. So therefore, I think I try to get you the best information I can, um, you know, as, as and try to put stuff together and link stuff together and, and say, hey, this has been, this, we've heard this before. Uh, one of the reasons I think I'm able to do that, and I'll tell you why, is because I, from the beginning of this show, have always taken in everybody's account, whether it was about ghosts, dogman, Bigfoot, UFOs, alien abduction. I don't cast anything out. And, you know, if it turns out that it doesn't fit into something for the show, it doesn't fit in. But I've done that from the beginning, whereas a lot of people, they, 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 they focus and compartmentalize. And so if somebody tells them a story that involves more than one weird thing, they're like, no, that's it. I just want that part. And then... They cut that out surgically and they put that in there and then that's all you get. But there's always a lot more to the pizza than just the one pepperoni. And that was that was also always important to us when we started this show because we always felt like you could lose so much when you, you know, because that like one thing that you're focusing on could be like the most smallest part of all the encounters that this person has gone mm-hmm. through. They could be going through their something their entire lives. But because this happened to them, this is all you want. Mm-hmm. And it really limits what experiences and what knowledge we can gain when you do that. That's right. So that's why we always try to focus on that. And that's one thing I always appreciate about you is that you're not, you don't just hear one story and you're like, okay, I'm ready to do that story on the show. You're always like, I heard this one story and now all these stories have come together and I'm ready to do a show about all these stories together Mm -hmm. because there's a thread, there's similarity, there's something that can tie them together that that makes it easier for the either audience or uh, listener or whoever to see that and be like, oh, okay, I can see how he, he... you know, where these stories are coming from. And it gives those stories a little bit more, as much believability as they can, you know? Yeah. Because if there's a precedent for it, you know, mm-hmm. and it, you know, you, I, I've gotten stories and I like the ones with the uh, gargoyle creature thing with the, the one that Alamogordo, New Mexico I used as an example. And then the one that was in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, and they're very similar. 
but they were like 11 years apart or something like that. I mean, I don't know how many, I can't remember how many years it was, but it was over a decade. Um, but yeah, the very similar creature, but it may take 10 years, but somebody saw the same thing. Um, but anyway, folks, that, that's what that, you know, I just wanted to throw that out there. We had talked about it on the Friday show and I wanted to make sure that everybody understood that, that, you know, there is nowhere you're going to go that you're going to get an absolute hundred percent true story, but you know, all you can do is take the word for it. Eyewitness accounts, people can say they saw something. People can come on your show and say they saw something. It doesn't mean it's true. So all you can do is say, so I told this person, being honest with you, I can't tell you 100%. You know, it's uh, it's all up to the audience. So that being said, uh, Paranormal Roundtable, uh, PRTPodcast.com, Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com, and then it's uh, Patreon.com slash PRTPodcast. You can join the $10, $20, $30 tier. If you join the $20 tier, you get – a swag bag, a $30 tier gets what we call a super swag bag. Join those tiers on the Patreon and message me on Patreon and we can communicate and we can be friends on there. Um, and you will have access to not only really cool merchandise, but the tickets for the conference. We're going to give you a, re- a, ref- a refund once you come to the conference. We're going to give you $25 back off of your ticket if you're a $30 tier uh, member. So that's something there. Uh, the conference, tell them about the conference, Anthony. Well, this is going to be our second annual Dogman Cryptid Conference. It's going to take place in uh, Fort Worth in, a, in an area called uh, White Settlement, right right there by Lake Worth. It's going to be on Labor Day weekend. Um, the main conference is going to be September 2nd and September 3rd. There's going to be a Saturday and a Sunday. And if you buy a VIP ticket... Then you also get the Friday night. Yeah, if you buy a VIP ticket, then you get a catered dinner and a meet and greet with the speakers, which is on Friday night. So VIPs get Friday night, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday. Yep. As far as the speakers, we're going to have Ken Gerhard, Barton Nunley, David Weatherly, Ron Moorhead, Ann Celine, Bettina Moss, D.A. Roberts, Adam Davies, Dan Nadrello, Christopher Garitano, Lyle Blackburn, Nick Redfern, Ron Murphy, Kenny Irish, Nick Valente, Sibylla Irwin, Jessica Jones, David Spinks, and Chad Lewis. And possibly Paul Sinclair and maybe a couple others. We're, we're, we're still not sure. Um, we may get a couple other people that are going to show up. So It's still a heavy. Yeah. You know, it's Josh annoying. Nanokia is going to be there from what lurks beneath. Um, you know, he's, it's so, yeah. And I've invited several others to come and, and be there as vendors for free. And then a few other people that are going to come and, and they've bought tables to be there. Um, it just depends on, on, you know, how much room we have and whatever. But uh, not everybody, not everybody's going to um, going to be able to make it. I understand that. But if you can, try to make it out. Folks, let's get started with these stories here because I'm, I'm eager to do this. And as always, we're going to drop this episode. The official link will be in the Paranormal Roundtable group on Facebook. And if you, you leave a comment on that official link, you may be chosen to win a free autograph book from one of many of those authors we just mentioned. So be sure and go and, and like and subscribe and then be sure and join our Paranormal Roundtable group on Facebook. And I would love to 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 have you make a comment and win a book. So here, let's get started here. I'm excited. This is something I've been wanting to do for a while. And uh, this is going to take up some time. So we're going to give you, you know, we're going to, I'm going to give you some stories here. I don't even know where to start. There's so many of them, dude. Um, you know, we were sitting around, we were eating dinner out on our deck the other night, or the other day, I guess it was breakfast, and Tony, it was me and you and Anthony and Nellie, and we were going over some of these stories, and we were trying to pick the best ones, and we couldn't decide. And so I just thought, you know what, Let, let's just give it what we got, and and, and, we'll, and you folks at home, uh, if you like this, we'll do another show soon. We'll, we'll, we'll give you, we'll come back to it in a month or two. But uh, for now... I'm going to begin with this one, the Caspian Sea. And now the Caspian Sea, if you don't know what that is, it's the, it's the world's largest uh, inland lake. But it is salt water, but it's only the third of the salinity of like the Black Sea or the, of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, it, what that means is like it's got way less salt water. And so, you know, it, you don't have sharks, you know, like like regular sharks running around and stuff like that. Uh, you do have some weird creatures that live there, but the Caspian Sea is known as a very haunted uh, place. It's a terrifying place for a lot of sailors. Now, it's I believe it's bordered. I got to look this uh, real quick to make sure that I'm not lying to you. I know Russia, Azerbaijan, I think Turkmenistan, Iran, 
and oh gosh, if I can remember the other one, there's one other country. Um, look it up, Tony. And um, just to show you that I'm not like just you know looking up stuff while I'm talking because I'm trying to remember if I'm correct on that. I'm I'm just going by memory. Uh, but and, and, and Tony can look that up. But anyway, they are rumors of a creature known as the Runan Shah, which is a humanoid fish-like creature. This creature, a lot of people have seen this thing, and there are people who really believe that this thing is a real thing. Uh, do you want? Do you say Georgia? Georgia. Well, Georgia's part of Russia. Yeah, that's Russia. Okay. Yeah, so it's Turkmenistan and then Kazakhstan. There you go, and then Iran. Uh, so th- those are the countries that it's that it's bordered by. Like I said, it is landlocked. Now the Runin Shah is a humanoid fish-like creature found in the Caspian Sea. It's described as a humanoid fish-like creature with a large mouth. The skin is typically black, brown, or a greenish brown, and it's got greenish brown seaweed-like hair. With webbed hands and feet. Now, that doesn't that sound like something you'd love to bring home to mom? Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of y'all probably have. And then she's like, you better get that fish person out of my house. Then to get the chunk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who's making fish? I don't want uh, no little fish grandbabies in my house. That's not going to happen. So th- th- this creature has been rumored to have attacked sailors for centuries. And there have been, of course, like all seas, there have been pirates. And there have been stories one of the stories I came across was from a guy from Azerbaijan. Now, I actually don't know this guy personally, but I do, I do have a friend who's Kazakhstan. He's from Kazakhstan. Now, not to be the Cossacks or not to be con, uh, confused with the Cossacks, two different things. Uh, Cossacks are from Russia, the from the Caucasus area, and I have Cossack blood in me, but not Kazakh blood. Kazakhstan is a uh, country that's like steeped in myth and legend too. And I was told a story by a guy from Azerbaijan who was once a sailor. And this guy was actually, it was his great grandfather who had passed this story down to him. He was Kazakh. And he claimed that one time they were fishing out on the Caspian Sea and they trawled up what appeared to be a fish type creature, a uh, humanoidal creature. And what this thing did when they – and th- there's a couple stories very similar to this in two totally different parts of the world. They cut the net, and when this thing was freed, it immediately went for the first human that was close to it, humongous mouth, and bit the bottom part of his leg and, and, like off. Didn't eat it. It just snapped it and bit it in half, and this thing was slithering around. When it tried to stand up, the description that was given to him by the, by his grandfather and his uh, friend who was a sailor, his great-grandfather and his friend who was a sailor, this happened in 1952. And what happened was they said that they actually, it took five of these guys to stab it with these, you know, those uh, fish hooks that they use with the little uh, curves on the end or whatever. They use them to like stab these, I guess there's some sort of seal or something they use them for. Um, they, they were stabbing this thing and they actually managed to finally get it thrown overboard, but not until it grabbed another sailor and took him into the depths with it. And that guy was never seen again. And this guy that told this story, he's actually a former, uh, boxer, <clears throat> but he claims that the story is completely true. And, uh, he, he gave me a whole, uh, typed out whatever. And, and he said that this story was told to him by his great grandfather. And now when I started looking into this, this is where it started. I was like, what is this? Like, you know, and so when I did the dive on this thing, no pun intended, I, I learned that the Runan Shah, the name actually means like Lord of the Sea. And it's considered to be like the master of the sea or whatever. And these creatures are thought to be not just found in the Caspian Sea, but all over the world. But the reason that there's a concentration of them in the in the Caspian Sea, and they're said to be very strong there. Is be, or have a stronghold there, is because according to the myths and legends uh, of the people of the Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and even in Iran, they believe that these creatures are a type of jinn. The Muslims there believe this, and they believe that they are actually there is an underwater hole or cavern that leads into an underwater world. And the world, I, I don't. Th- there's different names depending upon what dialect uh, they 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 call it a different name. Um, I think Runja is one of the names that they used, 
Uh, but I was looking up all this information, and they believe that th- this this under underwater world under um, like it's under the sea, and it is an opening to the inner earth. And in that inner earth, these creatures thrive there. And when they take people to the inner earth, you literally they don't just take you into the ocean. The legend is that you go to hell. They actually take you, and when you die, you go to hell. Like that, they, these creatures are demonic. And they walk on earthly feet. Now, this guy's grandfather told him uh, that this thing was literally wobbling when it stood up. But once it got its footing, it had these weird-looking nails on these webbed feet, and it would d- it dug into the to the deck of the boat and was able to keep its balance. And that's why it was able to do what it did. And one of the guys lost his leg, got bit off at the ankle, and the other guy was taken into the ocean. After this st- thing was stabbed multiple times, it didn't bleed blood. There was like a white type of fluid that came out of it. Um, I don't know what that is, but I've heard of this before. Now, the Greeks had a, had a, a legend of a, of a creature, and believe this, it was called an ichthyocentaur. Ichthyo mean like fish man, like centaur. It's like, a, yeah. So you had like an ichthyocentaur, and this thing was said to inhabit the areas of where the Minoans once had their, their you know, and, and then, of course, they were the pre- the predecessors of the Greeks, and they passed these legends down. the on, Off the Isle of Crete, there were sailors going way back. I found accounts of these sailors seeing these ichthyocentaurs. They would sometimes board their boats and grab their catches, their fish, and if they tried to interfere with them, they could easily get swiped by their claws and be beheaded or even have their heart ripped out of their chest. And some people, they claim that these things would actually take your head as a trophy and they would swim around in packs. Now, as crazy as that sounds, I got a story from an underwater welder off the coast of Spain. And he was, uh, I got two of them. Actually, I got one in Venezuela. and well, You know what? Three. Because we got one from Brazil. But that one, we're, we're going to do a show on Brazil. Me and Tony, are, we're going to do a deep dive on that. And we're going to release an episode about that. But this one, we'll start with the one off of, off of Spain and Gibraltar. There was a guy who, there was a ship he had to go down and he had to weld uh, part of the hull or whatever. And he went down. Uh, his name was Andreas. And he got, I got this story from his cousin who was quite younger than him, listener of the show. This man's already like in his 60s. He's like 63 years old. He said this happened when he was like in his 30s. He said he it, it made him stop diving. Let's put it that way. And the story that he told his uh, uh, cousin was very compelling. He said that he was down there and he was welding and something brushed against his shoulder. And when he turned and he looked right there to his right, he saw – I'm sorry, right there to his left, actually, he saw what looked like a humanoidal shape of a, of, a fa- of a face, and then it darted away. When he looked and he saw it darting away, he said, dude, it looked like the legs looked like the thing from the creature from the Black Lagoon. He's like, I'm not kidding. I'm like, what the heck am I looking at? He said, just then he turned and he had like a, a headlamp on, and it didn't show, it didn't show very much. Uh, you know, in the way of like lighting, he couldn't see very far in front of him. It was just made for him to be able to see what he was doing. And he said that it was kind of uh, unwieldy and something knocked it off of his head. And of course, you know, with that and then the, the, the mask and the shield and all that he had to have, he said he had to go back up top. Well, he gets halfway up and something grabs his leg and he looks down and the best he could feel, he was kicking at it. This thing bit a giant hole in, in the top of his foot and broke several bones. Now, you have a bunch of bones in your, on the top of your foot. You guys know we've all trained kickboxing. You can easily break your foot. Um, so w- w- what this guy said was that it had taken off the top of his foot, and he was like he was in excruciating pain. And then he realized that what was grabbing his leg was was humanoidal hands, like like hands, claws. And as he sh- struggled to get free, these thing, another one grabbed the back of his uh, uh, pack and was trying to pull his scuba tank off. And he said, "Dude, I was about to be killed." He goes, and finally, I I got up, and and he, he, you know he was so far down, you know he had gotten wrapped up under the ship. They had pushed him up under it, and he was trying to get up, and he was trying to come up for you know to get out of there or whatever. So when he made his ascent, um, eventually his airline got cut because these things were intelligent and they were not going to let him go. He said that they were pulling on him in in different directions and it was dark. He was pitch black. 
but you know, he could feel like their, their mouths and their, uh, their faces. And he said it was very like spiny and fish like finally, when he gets to the top, he, there's like three guys on the top of the ship that had rifles and they were firing down into the water and he nearly got shot himself. But thank goodness, uh, one of them got hit one of these creatures, but the way they described the creature that came up to the top. He didn't even get as good a look at it as because you saw the one face to face. It was white. It was pale, and it had a weird O shaped mouth with weird looking rounded like uh, mouth with teeth. And he said they were about an inch long each one of them, but they were needle like. And then he said that they the thing that bit his foot must have had a big mouth because it bit the top of his foot right off, and he ended up with a prosthetic the rest of his life. So. He gets up, they pull him in the, up out of the water, and they shot one of these creatures, which let out a weird screeching noise, which sounded like the squealing of a tire or a truck being hit, you know, like like metal. And they said that this thing, when it when it screamed, the others be, that were up up uh, uh, on the top of the water, they began to scream too in unison, and it like reverberated in their bodies, causing a couple of them to fall, the, the sailors to fall over and feel like they were going to die. Uh, on this transport ship. And then they, they, one of them actually fell overboard from, from whatever. And he was rescued. And luckily these creatures were sh- the, the, the fire, the shots being fired from their rifles sent them back down into the depths. The descriptions they gave were these things had weird looking elf like ears with reddish hair and their chest had reddish hair and they, they were, their arms were covered in a reddish, real fine reddish hair and their eyes were red like pinkish red from what they could see. And they had slits for noses and, like I said, the weird-looking mouth. And then, you know, it was just a very weird-looking creature. And they were like, they had never seen anything like this before. But if you go back and you and you look into these stories, there's a precedence for this. Like, uh, I know that there is another uh, type of creature found off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And this creature is said to eat your bottom half. Like, the, they'll... A person will get pulled up out of a boat, and I'm sure we've seen this in movies and in TV. You know, they pull the guy up, and just the top. he's got it's just his top half. You know, so the the story of Papua New Guinea sounds kind of you know Hollywood ish or whatever. But there's a story that I read, and this one here, I can't tell you what the origin of it is. I just read this, and I think I, I think I got it off. Of, I think I originally got off a of Reddit, but I found a clipping of it, and it talked about a sailor who fell overboard off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And immediately he was grabbed by three of these creatures. And as he was trying to surface, his two two arms were literally pulled off of his upper body. And then his midsection was was like crushed. Like it was like it had been pushed outward. Now, I know I read a book about Papua New Guinea. I know, Anthony, you read it too. Um, I think it was called- uh, Called Solomon Island Mysteries. Solomon Islands, yeah. And and, and it, was, it was very- uh, Crazy stories, Bigfoot, all kinds of weird stuff in there. It was a really interesting book. This this particular story, though, I, I, I can't remember if it was off of Reddit or if it was in Fate Magazine. But anyway, I just remember this reading this. And like I said, this isn't someone's account they gave me. This is something that I read. And this 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 guy was torn apart before, you know, like in front of like 12 people. They all saw this. Now, if, if you live in America, you know, you're probably going like, what is this? I'm the, you know, this is crazy. Um, you don't g- hear a whole lot about humanoids grabbing people, snatching people, or whatever. But you know, most of these accounts take place in other countries. Now, I know one of the the, the ones that we just dove into, and uh, Tony, where did it happen? It happened um, in between Hong Kong. Well, uh, in Fujian, it, it, they're off the Fujian province of China. Yeah, and, and it was it was in between Hong Kong and Taiwan. If you look at it on a map. And that is where this uh, particular encounter happened. This happened to a Chinese sailor. And I have several friends, actually, that live in Hong Kong and live in in those regions. And one of our friends is actually from the Fujian province and makes really dang good food. (laughs) But we were talking one day about the the, the weird myths and legends and stories. And we decided, you know what, we got to break these up into some of these countries. We can do an entire show on these. China would take like a, it's so several huge, episodes. It's and so each huge. province has yeah. like their own stories, which exactly. also interlap, just given different names. So it's like it's that one's going to be definitely worth it, but it, it definitely takes some work. It would, it's going to take a lot. Yeah. So we're, our next project that we're looking at is probably doing Brazil, and we had some of these from Brazil too, but this one came from a guy named Cho Sao. 
Uh, and that's the handle he goes by. So he gives me this story. It says, when I was 17, I was working on a, on a fishing vessel. When I, when I was on that vessel, I had a night duty to watch, you know, the, the do a patrol. He said, I thought it was kind of a futile, like, like a silly thing. Like, why am I doing this? What am I patrolling for? Mm -hmm. You know, if pirates come, he's like, I got nothing but a flare gun. This is what this guy's poor kid. You know, he's like, what am I going to do? I'm going to shoot these pirates with a flare gun. I mean, I'm like, I'm a sitting duck. I can run down and tell everybody, hey, we're being attacked. And this is what he really told me. He says, but what am I supposed to do? You know? And so he said he was working one night late or whatever, do, doing the night duty. He had to do it twice a week. And then he had another guy a little younger than him that had to do it. Hey, man, I don't know what the labor laws are over there, okay? 16, 17, they're over here on ships getting attacked by sea creatures. So anyway, he sees this hand come up over the top of the of the boat, and he's like, what am I watching here? He said he honestly thought it was like a greenish-white crab at first, and he was like, what am I seeing here? And so he goes over there to the to the edge of the, of the, of the ship, which is like, you know, this is a big ship. It's a freighter. And he's like, what am I looking at? And he goes, and I look down and, and attached to what I thought was this crab-like thing, it was a hand, but it only had four fingers. There were three fingers and then like what looked like a thumb that had popped up. And he sees another hand and he goes, okay, this these are hands, you know. He looks over the side and he sees this like sort of greenish, bluish, he said it was a greenish, bluish hue, but it was pale. But that, that it had a tint to it, like a greenish bluish tint to it. And he said he looked at it and he said that immediately its eyes began to turn red, like really red. And he said that this thing let out a screech and it literally, it hurt him, his head so bad that to this day he gets headaches and it throws off his equilibrium and he's 37 years old now. Um, and he said, as, as the time I took his story though, so that was probably about six months ago, you know, I don't know how old he is now, but 37, 38 so he said that this this thing uh, let out a, a screech that freaked him out. And he said, dude, I literally, it made my ears bleed or one of my ears bleed. And he's like, I don't know what this thing is. It begins to board the ship. He goes, I look on the other side and there's another one. He goes, so I did what any 17-year-old in that position would do with a flare gun. I shot at it with a flare and missed and then ran below deck screaming my head off. And uh, so he said that after that, you know, several of the guys woke up. Some of them had weapons. They grabbed their weapons and swords and got ready to fight, you know, whatever yeah. and got ready to fight. When they came above deck, the, these beings were gone. Mm. And everybody was like, okay. Boy who cried wolf. Yeah, they're like, okay, Cho, you're you're full of crap. Okay. And so then Cho was like, this no, I really this really happened to me. This is really this really happened to me. Well, luckily, well, maybe not luckily, but uh fortunately, unfortunately. Two nights later, the other guy that was the, the youngest guy on the ship, he it was his turn to do the guard duty. And he he they they set out an alarm, like a thing where they could like, you know, like a uh, what do you call it where you yell into it, a uh, megaphone. And it had like a little alarm on there, and he just went below deck and immediately everybody woke up. Same thing. They run above run above board, but they see he said half a dozen of these sailors actually saw something that kind of slithered over the top and jumped off of the ship. And he said he had no idea why they would be there. Well, a few days later, when they go to port, okay, which was in Hong Kong, uh, the captain tells him, he says, hey, I'm going to tell you guys, there was two of them that this happened to. And he says, I'm going to tell you, boys, this is what you saw. That's This is real. The, the, you weren't imagining these things. And what they were looking for was food. He says, the, I've encountered these before, but I don't tell the rest of the crew because they'll panic. He said, but me and some of the, the older sailors, that we know what these are. We know what these creatures are. And uh, the name that he gave, I cannot even begin to pronounce. Uh, it's something like Jiang Dia or some, some, I don't even want to butcher that. But anyway, I don't even want to attempt it. The Jiang Dia, whatever they are, they're Jiang Dao or whatever. They're called that, which means like, like basically sea killers. They literally are, are creatures that eat people. And what they do is they come on board ships in, in the night and they grab sailors and then disappear into the depths. Now, before you think, oh, this is just crazy, you know, these guys or these kids were probably just seeing something, whatever, uh, consider this. If you take that case along with all these others, you start to pull threads like I was talking about at the beginning of the show. Um, and you start to go, wait a minute. Now, maybe there is something to this. You go back and you compare notes. The, the the way that these creatures looked, 
Okay. The Zhang Dao or whatever the heck it's called. I can't say that. I'm sorry. It sounds unprofessional because I can't say it right. But these creatures are known to have a reddish hair on them and have hair going down a ridge over their back with like a fin, right? Now, if you were to think of human adaptation, right? Zane, you were talking about that. You want to touch on that? The Bajau people of Southeast Asia, and you were yeah. talking about how they had an adaptation. Yeah, yeah, they have a rare, like, phenot. Well, I mean, I don't know what you would consider rare when it comes to, like, genetic phenotypes, but they have a rare, like, adaptation to their phenotype, which basically allows them larger spleens because they're a seafaring people that stay on the water, like, a they majority. They live on the water, literally. Yeah, like, yeah. like, literally most of their lives, and they've done this for thousands of years. Um, they have a. They have a common ancestor that's like uh, close to that um, like direct area, and they do not have this phenotype, and they've never been next to the water a- as much as they have. So, like you usually get like small genetic differences between people niches, it, like of a region, yeah, mm-hmm. due to like certain like environmental factors or whatever. But this is like a very big one, which allows them to stay underwater for like upwards of five minutes, maybe even more to uh, be able to go farther underwater, exactly. free diving, w- like without any sort of uh, like, a, like a, like a modern equipment or, you know, uh, tanks or like it's an anything extreme like that. adaptation. Yeah. Like yeah. it's really uh, like, like I, like I had just told him before, like it's probably the biggest genetic difference I think I've ever heard of like another, um, you know, like tribe or like a race of people having, Mm-hmm. That like differs so greatly from like just a normal human and, composition. And, and one of our friends who's Jamaican, um, yeah, he had said that that there were rumors of people who had had gill slits behind their neck and their back, and we were joking about it one day. Well, it turns out like I've actually gotten a story out of there. I looked for that, and I went in. I, I'm in a bunch of groups, but I found somebody who had a story. And uh, this happened off Barbados, and they said that they were on, at a resort. Now we've actually heard this a couple times. This is, this is, I'm going to tell you this one. The other one is involves Brazil and I'm going to save that one for another show, but, and it's a little more in depth, but this one was a weird thing. This, this woman said that when they were there, they went to a resort area and they literally, these guys had long hair and they, when one of them, they were Polynesian though. They weren't from there. That's the thing. They were just, they were just running a, a deal there in the Caribbean. And when they took them to, to go swim She's like, they had long hair hanging down past their shoulders. She said they were very nice looking guys. Um, but she said that her and her husband and their uh, son and his friend all noticed when they pulled their hair back that they had little slits, three little slits on either side of the back of their neck. And I was like, are you sure that's what you saw? She says, absolutely. She's like, and they could go underwater and they were down there for several minutes. And they never, they were snorkeling. It was like a snorkeling thing. And they were just showing them how to use the snorkel. And she's like, they were like wondering how they were able to do this. And one of them pulled his hair back and she saw it. And she said, I was, I dared not say anything. I was afraid, you know, I didn't want to say anything. Um, the Cubans and the Puerto Ricans, they all have these weird stories where they gill men and whatever else you want to, you know, and everybody just kind of poo-poos it. But when you go and you do a dive, like I have, like I said, no pun intended, and you go around the world and you go, okay. You go off the coast of Belize, uh, you go off the coast of Papua New Guinea, you go to all these different places and you're like, what is going on here? You're starting to run into the same uh, stories and the same creatures. These creatures look different. Now, what what Zane was talking about is how these people, uh, human beings could have differences in the size of their spleen, which allows them to store oxygen so that they can swim better. What if these Polynesians actually adapted to have, uh, you know, to have gills? I mean, what if we have a common ancestor, but they're, they split off somewhere and, and this is a real thing. Now, before you say, oh, this is crazy. If you go back and you look at the legends of Hawaii and you start to take, and you take into account the stories of shark men, that they believe in that. Now, if you go back to the one, the stories I did with Kevin Panay, can you look at it for me, Anthony, with Hawaii, the ones about Hawaii, and I, you guys can go back and listen to those. They're, it's very interesting. And when you start to, to take a look at these uh, stories, you get the stories of the, the king of the shark people. I forgot his name. I didn't look it up for this episode. Um, I forgot what they called him. But anyway, he had 
like the the mouth of a shark on his back and he could shape shift. And these are stories that they actually believe, like the Hawaiians, uh, not all of them, but you know, the older generation in particular, they really believe in these stories and they believe that these things are real. And when you start to take into account, um, you know, all these different, uh, you know, it, it just, you start to think maybe this could be real. Why are there so many stories? Why are there so many, uh, different, uh, legends and, and they all kind of come together. Uh, here's one, and, and for example, you know, off the coast of, of Samoa, you know, the Island of a Samoa. Now I had a friend years ago who gave me a story and I haven't used it in anything yet. I've been planning on doing a show about these humanoidal creatures or whatever. And I thought, why not? I dug this one up and it's been in my file for a long time. And what he told me was that when he was a kid, he was he was uh, uh, out fishing. And what they do is they go out into the pretty deep water on these giant makeshift canoes. And they literally, sometimes they'll jump down into the water and spearfish, which is very dangerous because there's sharks everywhere. And he said that there was the story uh, going around the island that there was a hammerhead shark that was over 20 foot long. But the legend, and it had killed a couple people, and it's not like, you know, the, it makes the news because it's in Samoa. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the Pacific Ocean. And he said when, when, when he had heard from his cousin that one of his friends had been attacked, and he said that he survived, but his cousin told him, he said, dude, this thing is not a normal shark. He said, when this thing attacked me, it didn't bite me with its mouth. It grabbed me with what looked like arms. And as it pulled me toward it, the arms morphed into fins, and then it reached up to, to, to try to bite me, and I moved at the last second, and all it did is manage to tear off the back hamstring of his le right leg, um, which was which – was, it didn't uh, eat it, though. He was able, they were able to reattach it, and he got like, I think, 45 stitches in one area, and like, you know, like all together, I think it was like 112 stitches. It was like 60-something, and it was crazy. It was like in different areas. And they had to reattach his his uh, his muscle, and so he thought these stories are just crazy. You know, he's a, he's a nineteen year old kid. He's out there in the middle of the ocean. He's grown up on the ocean, and he's like he, he's not afraid of it or whatever. And he's like, dude, I jumped down into the water, and he goes, and what I saw right when I jumped down, I look and I see this humanoid looking figure. It was we didn't say humanoid. He said it was a human looking figure, and he said it immediately started swimming toward me. But it looked like a, a man, but it was giant. And he goes, dude, that is the biggest person I've ever seen. And he said, but the, he, he immediately he saw the white under, underbelly of this thing. And he said that the head was clearly like a hammer hammerhead shark when he got, you know, within about 30, 40 feet of it. He was like, this thing is coming straight for me. And it began to morph into a hammerhead shark right before his eyes. And he said it was right about to, to take him down. Like it was about to hit him. And he jumped back up into the under the raft and his friends like, well, not raft. It's like a canoe, whatever, but they, they, I forgot what they call it. They pulled him into it. And he said that at the last second, this thing breached and it just came up and then flew back. He's like, have you ever seen shark week where the, 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 the sharks pop up with the air jaws? He said, that's what it looked like. And he said, this thing was massive. It was as big as any great white he'd ever seen. And they all freaked out and they started praying and, and, you know, and they started paddling back to shore and this thing hit their canoe type boat. And, and he said it was like a miracle from God. Literally, they were all praying and that it was moving back and forth and rocking and the waves were hitting it because this thing was making waves. And he said, eventually we got to the, almost to the shallows. We thought this thing had left and it was gone. He said, then we look back and we see it like literally in, in about 12 foot of water and it was standing up like straight up and it was pulling on his boat. And they all jumped out and started swimming. And then they look back and they see this thing submerge and go in the water. And he goes, imagine the terror. We're all trying to swim back to shore. And this thing had just gotten, gotten, you know, it, it figured out we weren't in the, in the, in the, sh in the boat anymore. And it went under and he goes, I look back and I see it going for one of my friends. And he said that at the last minute, his friend moved and this thing went right past him and it hit like a sandbar and kind of turned off and veered away. And it kind of got stuck for a minute because it was so large. And he said, when we got to shore, we could see it moving around out there. And when it stood up, it was like a man. It looked like a human, like humanoidal creature, but mixed with like a shark. 
And he asked me if I'd ever heard anything like that. Well, of course, when he told me this story, I was like, hell no, I never heard anything like that. I mean, if I had, I'd, I would, you know, I'd, I would have been like, yeah, this is crazy. But I mean, you know, and, and we're sitting here and we're in a bar and we're drinking, you know, in the, you know, the club and we're sitting there drinking. And actually, Tony, your, your dad, and I think Zane, your dad was there when, when this guy told the story, but we were all sitting around talking. And when, when this guy was telling me this story and I'm thinking, this is a fascinating story, but you know, there's a guy in a bar drinking, right? Well, it's not until you go back years later that you start looking into these stories of the Runan Shah and the, you know, the Zhe Kuang or whatever, the, whatever they're called and the Chinese, I, I, I can't say the name correctly, but. So they, by the way, the Hawaii episodes were 165 and 166. Yes. And if you go back to those, we talk about a lot of this kind of stuff and the Ichthyo centaurs. And, and so you get the comparisons here. Now, this is what I'm going to tell you. I'll bring it home with the, with the Bajau people of the Southeast Asia and see what, what it has to do with them and their adaptation is the ones from the Caspian Sea look almost the same as the one off of Gibraltar, um, off the one, the, the ones off of, um, Papua New Guinea, you know, the same creatures, you know, they look like, 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 or I'm saying the shark person in Papua New Guinea, right? And then the, the Samoan, there's two, there's a shark people and, and, but they're different, right? But the ones in the Caspian Sea, they look a lot like the ones that the divers saw off the coast of Spain. Um, but they're a little bit different. But they have the same reddish hair, except the ones in in the, in, in, uh, in off the coast of uh, the Fujian uh, China, they had like a, a fin on their back, right? Then you look at these creatures, the ones in, in, in Spain, there wasn't a fin. They don't remember seeing any kind of fin or anything like that. But it, they both had a reddish brown hair, just like the ones in the Caspian Sea. Although they they look very similar, um, they're clearly like uh, different types of species or something. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying that these are even completely flesh and blood. They could be what you call undines. The undines. Yeah, He's okay. like, I was trying to figure out cause... undines. <laughs> The know. Undines, yes, the Undines, because yeah. and, and Tony, you did some research. What are the Undines? The Undines are a category of elemental beings associated with water, stemming from the alchemetic writings of oh Paracelsus. Later writers de developed the Undines into a water nymph in its own right, and it continues to live in modern literature and art. If you think of that as the Undine, there is a place called. Placentia in, in Belize. And now this place, I was given a story out of there, and this person claims that it's uh, Brujetia Agua. It's basically like black magic, water magic. And what it was was a creature that was summoned literally to kill someone. And I believe that, that there was some sort of like uh, flap or something at that time. People were seeing it, and they were claiming that there was a creature that was going around killing people. And a woman came forward and said that, no, it's not a shark. It's something that I myself conjured up. And the way she described it um, was Manos Pascal, like fish man, right? And she said that this fish man or whatever that she had conjured up, it, it, it get this, it had orange hair on top of its head, fire eyes. The eyes were fuego, you know, like flames. And she said that its mouth was full of teeth and it, and it had a grin like the devil. She described this to the police and this one man, his name was Mario. Uh, I want to say his name was Mario Santiago, but I'm not for sure that's hundred percent correct. I don't have the information right in front of me, but anyway, this man supposedly was killed by one of these creatures. And it was all because she was asked by another woman who never, never faced trial. She didn't, because this was never proven that it was one of these uh, uh, Manos Pascal, whatever. But that she, that she actually had conjured this guy, creature, whatever, demon, whatever it was. It was a seven-foot-tall creature, and it looked very much like what people describe as these things from the Caspian Sea and these other creatures. But if she can conjure this thing up to kill someone, this Mario, whatever his name was, yeah, I mean, think about it. You know, d does that put it in the category of demonic? Is it a demon? Because obviously you can summon one of these things to do your bidding. What she claimed, and, and this was this was a friend of mine who actually had told me this story. He goes, go look it up. There's a story. I couldn't find a whole lot about it. 
Um, but I did talk to him and a couple of his relatives, and they lived in that region. They lived in Santa Cruz, which is uh, north of Pal- Pal- of Placentia. Now, he said that it was all about in the in the Belizean newspapers back in the eighties or whatever this happened. I don't know if anybody can can find it or not, but there's there's tons of records and stories of these creatures. And th- this woman was questioned by the police. Her name was Maria something or another. And she claimed that, yes, she admitted to the police that she had done this and that this, uh, at, at the behest of this Maria woman, whatever. So this uh, bru- bruja, this witch, what she claimed this creature uh, asked for was a finger from a human bone and a, a human hand. Don't tell me how she got it. She must have dug it up in the cemetery or she killed someone. I don't know. Two human teeth. Uh, and, and an actual uh, two dogs, uh, two dog eyes, and like a fish or a, or a two frog uh, bellies, some something weird like that. And then there was a couple other things, like a weird coral that it asked for. And you give all of these things to this creature along with a pint of pig's blood. Apparently, this makes this thing go and do devious creature things, whatever. Well, that would make sense because uh, the first thing that I found, uh, like it's not directly like a related story, but – to to uh, whether or, or like or not like it could be a demon or not. It says at the newly discovered water temple Maya, the the Mayans offered sacrifices to end droughts. Yeah. So directly in that area, I'm mm-hmm. sure is a lot of that's probably correct. Yeah. And so this thing is considered a water demon, and they said that it's found in in the in the rivers that come in from the ocean at the mouths of rivers and oceans, and it hangs out in brackish water. Now, it's a demon, right? a water demon or that's considered a water demon and it can be summoned and given gifts like these horrible things that it asked for. It's probably like a type of Naga or something. But then it goes, it's able to swim around and live in these certain areas. That's where it's found. So there again, are these demons, are they from the inner earth? And is it like the stories of the Runan Shah where they drag you under the water and then your soul goes to hell? Because the, the stories are from the, I think it's from the Turkmenistan side you can only be taken down by the Runan Shah if you are you are out of the grace of God. Right. So that's the only way they can attack you and take you down from what I researched. You got to wonder about that because, it, you know, it, it, these things are considered to be demons. Like, and of course, we've all heard, you know, these are demons. And it's like, well, they bleed red blood, you know, <laughs> and I'm going to kill it. But the thing is, you know. Where does the line between demon and actual flesh, you know, where does it begin? Where does it end? And these adaptations of people, of uh, these creatures, there's different species. Um, Do they all come from the inner earth or did some originate from there? Because supposedly there's a huge ocean under the water. And are places like the Caspian Sea actually connected? Some people believe, because I got a story out of Lake Huron, you know, where somebody had seen a black dog. We didn't get to talk about that on the shadow dog story, but that I'm not going to get into the whole thing because it's a good story, but somebody saw one of these come out of the water doing what it did and then descend back down into the water. Uh, it was a black dog, a giant black dog, like 15 foot long. And why was it swimming in the water and why did it not need to breathe? Now, is there some sort of underwater passage that even like goes under the Atlantic Um, supposedly one of the mouths to hell is found in the Atlantic and there have been black magic practitioners off the Ivory coast who I actually spoke to. I literally talked to this guy. There's one of them that was a, he, he claims, and this is what he claims. And I worked with this guy's cousin at the club and he introduced me to this guy who was a practitioner of black magic. Now he was Lebanese by by uh, birth, but he lived in uh, off the coast of uh, the Ivory Coast of Africa, and he said that if you make a sacrifice uh, on the beach there, that these creatures will come out of the water, and if you are in good standing with their demonic sea god of whatever the whatever I can't remember the name. It's been so long. When he told me this, but they, it'll take you into the water, into the ocean. They'll take you and they'll let they'll put you in like a bubble where you can breathe, and then they will take you to this underwater kingdom where literally, literally the devil lives. And that is where another demon named Mammon, who's the god of money, and supposedly he resides there too. And there is an underwater kingdom. And when you go there, according to this guy, as we told me, 
he says that there are all these ma- magicians and sorcerers and warlocks that practice there. And then they're taken back there and some of them walk through what it looks like a watery portal. But he says, if you're found to be unworthy for whatever reason, when you walk to that underwater portal to go back to your, your life where you came from, you may end up just stranded in the middle of the ocean, which would suck bad. So you just end up floating in the middle of who knows where. Are you wearing Nikes? In the middle of the ocean. <laughs> well, if you're wearing like. Nikes, they're like, yay, go in. I'm just joking. I mean, <laughs> uh, it, it pretty much would be opposite day there. I'm pretty sure that if you're, you know, one of those black magic practitioners who's wavering in your faith or service to the Lord of the deep or whatever the heck they're serving, um, yeah, that you, you walk through that portal and he said he watched people go and that one of these demons literally he said he was about 10 foot tall and he was, he was covered in like what it looked like a black silt, like slime, you know, well, not his words. That's what I said. It was, must've been, you know, and he said that it, it put, put him on his shoulder and it told him in Arabic, perfect Arabic. And he's like, oh, you speak Arabic. And he says, I speak 172 languages, some of which don't exist anymore. And he told him, he says, if you're unworthy, you will be stranded and lost at sea. He says, but I'm here. And this guy was creepy, dude. Like, I mean, we're not talking about wearing gothic clothing and pentagrams. This dude, you could look in his eyes and see he was pretty much committed to his craft. And at that point, I got ill just being around him. So I spent a lot of time just avoiding that guy while he was visiting. And then he eventually, he liked me. He tried to give me a hug when he left. And I said, oh, I'm in a hurry. And I I put the fist out, you know. And then when he went to fist bump me, I like missed on purpose and like ran inside. Oh, I see ya. Woo, catch ya. You know, so I was like, all right, you know. Missed and punched him. Yeah. 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 And and, and I I don't want to even say his name. It started with an A. But anyway, he he was an odd duck to say the least. And, And so, you know, like I've been wanting to do this this show for a long time and so i got some good ones out here i but, was uh looking up some other creatures that might have that similarity of just being like a sea creature with red hair mm-hmm. and uh there's a native american myth called a uh, apo tamkin it's a sea per- uh, serpent that has long red hair and drags unwary unsupervised children into the water and eats them well that's pleasant yeah. what's it called poo poo napkin apo tamkin <laughs> a- oh, Apo Tampon. Okay. Yeah. Apo Tampon. <laughs> Apo Tampon. Now, now what, what kind of, uh, what is that? Um, it doesn't really describe much. It doesn't just, say what native tribe it is. It's just No, I was just looking up some other creatures that might have that similarity. Okay. Something so this is what I found. Yeah. I'm sure if I looked into Texas, it Florida. <laughs> Could be anything. I mean, like, what's, you know? what's the, well, it's probably south. What were some of the uh, tribes in, like, the Florida region back in, like, 16, 1500? I mean, well, yeah. I mean, there could be, it could be any of those. The thing about the sea creatures is that if there was one thing that I could be like, oh, it might be flesh and blood, it's anything in the sea because it's such a vast area and mm-hmm. there's so much of it we don't understand. I think that these mosasaurs and these plesiosaur mm-hmm. creatures, yeah, I mean, they're, they're d- descendants in, at least, and I believe the Mamil- – what is his name? Uh, Makili Mbembe. Mm-hmm. I believe it's real. Yeah. Mouthful. I believe that Makila Mbembe is a real thing. I think that in Congo that they're they're there's enough pockets and there's they enough. Say that they call it the elephant killer. It kills elephants. There's enough things out there that we like in the water that we just still don't understand. That we like we find new creatures. There's a squid that looks like a hundred tall alien just oh, yeah. floating around. Yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah, we need to, we need to cover that Russian story about what they found in Antarctica and that in that landlocked lake under the ground, mm-hmm. two three miles down or whatever. They gathered some kind of number designation. I forgot. And folks, if it sounds like I'm a little unprepared, I am a little unprepared. I thought I had a better memory, but it's been a long night and I did the live stream and this we're actually recording this Friday in the studio. And I, I had a guest lined up, but he had had knee surgery. And so he had to cancel And this show was supposed to be next week where I was going to have, but I had, we had to do it tonight. So, um, but I got tons of these stories and I, I can revisit this subject at any time. Uh, let me tell you something. I got uh, information and stories to go on for eternity. I mean, believe me, I started off, like I said, just getting, you know, I had a, I had a passel of stories to begin with. And it just, you know, every time I tell a story, then I, I get three or four more to add to that, you know. So we have a bevy of, of stories and there's no shortage of, of weirdness and so, Especially sea ones because, I mean, as I always say, Jurassic Park rules, whatever monsters are on land, there's always worse ones underwater. So that's why. So I'm going to read you an article. Yeah. I'm going to read you an article. This is Pravda. 
And it's, it was written by Olga. I didn't want to mess his name up here. Let me make sure I got it right. Oh, okay. Olga Sovka. This is giving them credit for this story. Uh, and it says mysterious amphibious human-like creatures spotted in the Caspian Sea. And uh, it looks like it's from March 25th, 2005. It says, for the last two years, residents of coastal areas around the southern and southwestern Caspian Sea have been reporting of some amphibious creature resembling a human being. In March this year, an eyewitness account from the crew of the Baku and Azari Trawler was published by Iranian newspaper Zindagi. The, the, that creature was swimming parallel course near the boat for a long time, said Gafar Gassanov, a captain of the ship. At the beginning, we thought it was a big fish, but then we spotted hair on the head of the monster and his fins looked pretty strange. The front part of his body was equipped with arms, said the captain. Back in Azerbaijan, nobody took took us seriously. It sounded ridiculous to those who thought that the guy must have been drinking while on board. On the, on the contrary, shortly after the publication of his interview, the offices of the Iranian paper got flooded with numerous letters of readers who claimed that the story was yet another ex a piece of evidence proving the existence of the so-called man of the sea. The readers pointed out that many fishermen have reportedly seen the strange creatures at sea and on shore after the seabed volcanoes in the area of Babelsera had come to life uh, in February and offshore oil uh, production operations had intensified in the Caspian. Uh, it says all the eyewitnesses, all the eyewitness accounts provide a similar description of the marine humanoid. His height is 165 to 168 centimeters. He has a strong build protruding, Stenoid stomach, his feet are pinniped, and he has four webbed fingers on either of his hands. His skin is of moonlight color. The hair on his head looks black and green. His arms and legs are shorter and heavier than those of a medium-built person. Apart from the fingernails, he has nails growing on the tip of his aquiline nose that like a dolphin's be a beak that looks like a dolphin's beak. No information as to his ears. See, that's another thing. I never get any information about the ears. And the hair is always either black or a reddish brown color. And, and I never get anything about ears. I never hear anything other than that one account where when those creatures uh, surface, oh, elf they have like the elfish looking ears. Yeah. So it says no information as to the ears. The eyes are large and or 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 orbicular. The mouth of the creature is fairly large. His upper jaw is, pro is prognathic and his lower lip flows smoothly into the neck. His chin is missing. Iranians dubbed the creature Runan Shah, master of the sea and rivers. The name is partly based on stories of large schools of fish accompanying the creature at sea. Other stories refer to the waters that would turn crystal clear and stay that way for two or three days after the creature was seen swimming in those areas. Fishermen claim that fishes that stay alive for a while in the net can feel the creature coming out of the deep blue sea. Fishes reported producing barely heard gurgling sounds as the monster came near. He was said to answer the call of the catch by making similar throaty sounds. Some researchers believe that there is no smoke without fire. The story circulating in Iran can be true. Besides, last May, Runan Shah was seen by Azeri fishermen living in the villages located between the cities of Astara and Linkaran. According to a theory, the creature is not alone. There's a family of underwater humans who are on a mission to tackle environmental problems of the Caspian. The reproduction of flora and fauna in the Caspian has significantly deteriorated due to a surge in offshore Oil production operates underwater volcanic activity in the above parts of the sea, blah, blah, blah. And then it goes on to talk about the, 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 the Caspian Runan Shah is not the only species of underwater humans on record. Herodotus and Plato believe that original human beings were amphibious and might have founded an underwater state. Modern doctors actually agree to that theory by saying that hiccup is an atavism dating back to ancient times when humans had both lungs and gills. So the universe and humankind that was published in St. Petersburg in 1905 contains a story of marine female caught in the Caribbean. It also had stories about dead bodies of the amphibious humans washed ashore in the Azores in 1876. Their descriptions largely correspond with the reported description of the Runan Shah, amphibious-like human beings reported in Karelia in 1928. The creature was repeatedly seen in the lake of Ved Lozero by local residents. A group of researchers from the... Petro Zavotsk University arrived to investigate the, ca the case on location. Unfortunately, the findings were classified, and the members of the party eventually perished in the gulags of Russia, of communist Russia. According to latest reports in the media, Iranians have already started their research on the Caspian phenomenon. The international community 
scientific community might as well help unravel the mystery of politics. Do not get in the way of science this time around. So there you have it, folks. That is a lot of information about those creatures. I I, I know that it's a lot to take in, but I'm going to tell you one last story before we bail because we got the show started off a little bit late. And I'm sure somebody's time stamped and said, your show got to start until eight minutes in. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you another story so we can, we can make sure we fill in that gap. This story, it was about a guy that was working off the coast of Venezuela. Uh, su- supposedly, had this, as the story goes, the woman that gave me this, she claims that she's a, she was a Venezuelan. She moved out of that country because, let's just be honest, things weren't going well there. And so she said that her uncle was a dot, was a uh, underwater welder and he was down there welding one time and it was off the coast of uh, Venezuela and very similar to what happened to the guy, except the water was a lot clearer. He could see it wasn't off the coast of Spain where, where he was at, where it was real deep and he couldn't see, uh, th- this was like the, it was v- very visible and he sees these giant, like what w- he knows they're Mako's. And he's, he's like, they've swim around me and they'll, they'll shoot out and attack a fish. But he goes, but I didn't feel terrified around them. He goes, even though they're really large and they're scary, they typically don't mess with me. And he said one time one of them got kind of close and he just turned his blowtorch at it and it took care of that. <clears throat> and he said that they seemed to kind of understand like when one of them witnessed that, there were a couple others in the area. And after that, they all just kind of backed off. And so he kind of got to know two or three of them in particular that would hang around where he was at. And so he said, dude, one day, he didn't say dude, but that's me talking. But she said one day that, that he had gone down there to, to weld and this one of the really big sharks was just swimming along and it like darted towards something. And he said, oh, it's going after a fish. He sees these three, first there were just three of them. And he said that they had these weird looking spears and that they had this like thing that protruded out from it and kind of would shoot it and, and stick it. And it stuck the, the side of the, one of the shark, one of those Makos and they hit it and they were so fast that they were able to like track it and keep it from escaping. After the first shot, it tried to bolt and then it got a, a, another shot that went like this uh, rod that would come out like a spear with a little hook on the end and then go back in to this little stick they had. And they each had one of these. And at first, like I said, there was only three. Then he looked and there was a fourth one who was huge, who must have been the shot caller, I guess, because he was bigger than all the others. And the other three were attacking the shark. He said they had that thing cut open and sliced into chunks in minutes. And then he said there was so much blood in the water, he thought, man, I better get out of here because there's other sharks coming around now because of all the blood. He said, and each one of them grabbed a piece of this shark and then they just dipped, disappeared into the depths. Like they all just, just dove and they were gone. He said the big one just kind of hovered there in the ocean, just bobbing back and forth, looking at him for a good couple minutes. And he thought, you know, the whole time he was going up, he just kept staring at it and it kept staring at him. And then finally it just turned and it, and it swam away. The description he gave, the, the legs of these creatures would not have been able to walk on land. There's no way. They were just straight fins. Like if you, like a, the way it was described to me, it was like a mermaid like a fish tail, but it was in two parts. You know what I mean? So, and, and they had very muscular upper bodies and they had weird looking bony elbows with spikes coming off of them and weird webbed like hands, but they were able to hold those sticks, you know, and use them. And they had long brownish hair and they had like blackish uh, hair over their backs and that kind of contrasted from the hair on their head. And he said that these looked like human fish hybrids. It's only the way he could describe them. Now, here's one more before I go. This happened off the coast. Of, this is off Costa Rica. Um, this story was given to me by a listener years ago. He said, this is a very short story, but he said, dude, years ago, I went to the beach and I fell asleep in Costa Rica. And as I was napping, he had a little wiener dog. And it was a sad story. His little dog was sitting there sleeping next to him and he hears splashing come out of the water. And then he hears yelping. And he looks up and his dog, Will, his dog's name was Will, um, was being carried off by what looked like two creatures from the Black Lagoon, as he described it. And then they went into the shallows and he ran after them. And then he realized, he goes, what am I going to do if I catch up to these things? I can't stop these things. 
And I guess his dog had gotten up and was trying to use the bathroom because when he sat up and he realized that the dog had gone, you know, a few meters away from him and made, made poop. And I guess that's when these things grabbed it. And luckily for him, they didn't grab him. He said that they looked large enough to grab him. He said, I'm a 150 pound guy, but you know, he goes, I guess I'm lucky, but he goes, they took my best friend. It was sad that they, but, but he, they took his dog, but these things came out of the water. I don't know what for, but they grabbed his animal. Um, now he asked me a question. He said, what, what would make these things take my dog and not just eat the, you know, food out of the ocean? And I was like, well, your dog's a mammal. And there's a lot of things that like to eat mammals, you know, fish and, you know, reptiles. And uh, I asked him, I said, what did they look like? He said, like, like, you know, more reptilian looking than fish, but kind of fish like, you know, and that's all he could tell me. I said, it was, he said it was dark, you know, he got a, he had a flashlight and he shined it, but he left me with this. He said, I, I would recommend to your listeners, don't sleep on the beach. And Tony, Zane, Anthony, y'all have all heard stories of things coming out of the water and grabbing stuff on the beach. Well, this isn't the first time we've heard this. You've heard this in South Padre, Port Aransas, Padre Island, um, well, several thing. other places. Well, There's way too many mosquitoes. You shouldn't I'll never <laughs> be doing that. You should just stay away from the water when it's nighttime. You know, first off, sh- sharks are going to be out. Yeah, don't be close to the water yeah, at all. Just stay away from it. it. And things might come out now and grab you or your animals. So <laughs> just... Stay well, we away. had somebody that got their dog taken, you know, close to Port Aransas, I mean, Mustang Island. Um, I think it happens more often. I think when they report it, the police at these, and I'm not bagging because I like to go to these places, but think about it. If you're a tourist town, the last thing you want is somebody to believe that there's some kind of creature coming onto the beach and grabbing animals because your money is made between the months of May and September. Or maybe you do. And so, well, I don't yeah, think I don't so know. because if if, if no, it came I mean, out that people's think- animals were getting snatched, dang, people ain't gonna be. They're gonna be like, we're not going to that beach. We're going around the other side. Well, Why think would we about it? I mean, there's a Mothman town. There's a huge Bigfoot. Like it's accepted everywhere, but there's no beaches that have like, oh, Mermaidville here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they don't. Yeah. They don't want anybody. Any supernatural things like that. Yeah, I mean, and especially it, it, once people start getting killed. Mm-hmm. Now. Think about it, Point Pleasant, Mothman, you know, and they're like, come to Point Pleasant where 14 people have been killed and their animals have been killed. You're not going to run there. It's like, I, you know what? Let's go there and get killed. Now you have the weirdos like us, not us, but our our community who will go out there and investigate. But the average person hears about this. They're not going to want, if it came out in, in the Northwest, right? And they said, hey. You know, let's all go to Mount Hood. Well, what's there? Well, Bigfoot's tearing people's heads off there and eating their pets. Oh, no, I think I'm good. I think I'll just stay here and- Yeah, just go around you know, that. It sounds like- Yeah, it's... I think I'll just like, uh, you know, stay here and drink my uh, micro brew beer and be a, you know, hippy dippy guy because that's not something I want to deal with. I mean, I just, I honestly think that's the case. I really don't think that people are going to want to go. Uh, and so I think that, that what- the story we got about the person's dog being taken at Port Aransas, I think it's happened more than that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I believe it's it's there's things there. I'm pretty sure it's common for things to just go missing and then they blame it on mm-hmm. something else. I mean, Well, your dad's dog. Yeah. His dog years ago. He, I remember his dog. I forgot his name. It was a little uh, a chihuahua. And uh, he was a cute little dude. Spencer. That was his name. And they went down to Port Aransas and they came back without him and they never figured out what happened to him. Now, you know, back at that time, you know, this was the late nineties. I didn't go, Hey, uh, you know, mermaids, a mermaid, <laughs> mermaid man came and took your dog. Um, Monocle boy. <laughs> <laughs> Two of the vertical. What is it? Is the, the invisible, well, the, the invisible bit mobile or oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, the invisible bit mobile. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't think of it like as like a, a you know, merman from Masters of the Universe came out and blah, 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 your dog and killed him. But you know, now, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm not so sure because I mean, you know, and, and like I said, these places that are touristy hotspots, they're not going to tell you, Hey, there's fish people coming out of the water to eat your animals. Well, this is going to seem a little wild because obviously we'll have no way to figure this out, but I wonder if these kind of like mermaid like ones that you talked about in this last one are have like an anti uh <clears throat> I wonder if 
they don't like these more scaly fish like ones because they seem to be more from the inner earth mm-hmm. you know what i mean like they, they seem kind of like how the rake has adaptations which would make me think that it could survive very well underground these things kind of have things that make me think it would survive very well in like deeper away from sunlight areas where you know the, the pressure is more intense so you would have harder mm-hmm. skin compared to these other ones which seem more fleshy and softer kind of reptilian mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There you go. There's the adaptation. Well, folks, that's all the time we got for tonight. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, it's, it's a long time coming. I've been waiting to do this one for a long time. Uh, it was slated to be covered, uh, you know, by me and another guy a long time ago, and it just never came to fruition. I waited and waited for this guy, and he never did get it together. And so we're here, we're doing it, and we did it, and now uh, you can enjoy it. Thank you for listening to Paranormal Roundtable. Don't forget to get your tickets at Eventbrite. Uh, go to Eventbrite. What's it listed under, Anthony? Second annual Dogman? Paranormal Roundtable, second annual Dogman. Crypt-